those of you in the room, those of you joining online, uh, just thanks, thanks for being with us. Uh, there's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. And that is true of a lot of things, including being a disciple. A disciple is someone who is learning to become like Jesus and be more filled with his courage, hope, and joy. And we are today at the end of a sermon series where we've been looking at some practices that have helped people become like Jesus and be more filled with his courage, hope, and joy. And today, the last practice we're going to look at is community, which is fitting because we just finished a, a weekend where over 400 of us engaged in prayer and fasting. There were people praying every hour for 24 hours here and at home. And this, this coincided with the end of our East African communities, New Hope communities, 21 days of prayer and fasting that also coincided with the commemoration of the 30th, uh, 30 years since the Rwandan genocide against Tutsis. We did this together as a community. Because while we need time with solo time with Jesus, one-on-one -on -one in prayer and scripture, we need that, but we also need community. We cannot become like Jesus alone. We need to do this together. We need to go together, which is simultaneously a great blessing, but also kind of hard to do, right? Because I don't want to shock anyone here, but we don't always agree in this church <laughs> about everything, right? And, and we have to trust each other, and that can be kind of hard to do, right? Because we've all been hurt in relationships before, and that can make us kind of cautious and give us kind of trust problems, right? For me, it's like cookies, I often say that oatmeal raisin cookies are the reason I have trust issues, right? Because you know, you're like, ooh, look, chocolate chip cookies, ooh, raisins, right? <laughs> Some of you have had relationships like that, where you're like, ooh, chocolate chip, no, raisin relationship, right? And it, I know some of you may like raisins, but come on, chocolate chips are better, right? So we got trust issues. But as difficult as community can be, it is also an incredible blessing. Every study on happiness ever done shows that the thing that actually brings us joy is relationships. But in spite of all kinds of technology that connects us, we've never been more lonelier and isolated than ever before. Only 8% of Americans report having a conversation with a neighbor in the last year. 25% say they have no friends at all. And COVID supersized our loneliness. Now we work at home, online, by ourselves, we shop at home, we do church at home online, but we need other people. Even introverts, okay? They need people. That just means you prefer one-on-one -on -one to large crowds. There's a famous study that was done during World War II where they found that rates of depression in London went down during the Blitz, where the Nazis bombed London every night for eight months. Rates of depression went down, and when the bombing ended, the rates of depression went back up to normal levels. <clears throat> and it wasn't because people loved bombing that depression went down. It was because of the sense of togetherness and community as they joined together just to survive it. We need each other. Loneliness is worse for our health than smoking. And our isolation is destroying our U.S. culture right now because, in, because it's, our loneliness is driving us to tribalism. Right? In our loneliness, we turn to political tribes to feel like we're part of something. But tribalism is the evil twin of community. Tribalism is based on anger. Community is based on love. Right? Community is based on what we're for. Tribalism is based on what and all too often who we're against. And ever since the end of World War II, U.S. culture, we have pursued autonomy over community. Move to the suburbs, away from everyone, where the front porch, where we used to interact with others, has now been replaced by the backyard. And autonomy can be good in, in some ways, but it is out of control in the United States. And increasingly, autonomy doesn't look like freedom anymore. It looks like anarchy as everyone is demanding that they get their way about everything as though there's nobody else in the world but them. Which is why I'm really glad that we have New Hope Revival in this part of this church and Chinese Covenant as part of this church. There are more community-oriented cultures and we have so much to learn. They can teach the rest of us so much. I'm, that's why I'm so glad we're here. We need community to become like Jesus and have his courage, his hope, his joy. Which brings me to today's text. 
in Mark chapter 2. And it says, when Jesus entered Capernaum, the people gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them, four friends. Since they couldn't get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above, above Jesus, by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. Okay, you got to picture this. So roofs back then were made of branches and dried mud. So as they're digging this hole in the roof, right, there this crowd below, there would have been dirt falling on them and branches and twigs and stuff, right? So probably kind of irritating for the folks there. And I always think about the poor guy that owned this house, right? Like he's like standing there going, is State Farm going to cover that? Because, like, wow, this is just right. People are probably pretty annoyed. And then it says, when Jesus saw their faith, whose faith? There, the four friends' faith. Maybe the paralyzed man, too, but definitely the four friends. He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were thinking to themselves, he's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking, and he said, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took the mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And in the original Greek, the word there that's used for amaze would be better translated, this blew their minds. And they praised God saying, we've never seen anything like this. This story shows us a couple of things about biblical community. And the first is this. In biblical community, we carry each other's mats. Right, the four friends in this story are just a great example of how we can get spiritually paralyzed or, or, or socially paralyzed or emotionally paralyzed, and we need others to carry us to Jesus when we can't do it on our own. And the word mat gets repeated over and over and over again uh, in, in this story, and it's a metaphor for what's holding this paralyzed man back. And we all have a mat. Right? Relationship struggles, school or work problems, health issues, financial problems, or just feeling far from God. I got a mat, you got a mat, all God's children got mats. But in biblical community, we help carry each other's mats the way this man's friends did for him. But in order for that to work, we have to admit that we have a mat. And in our East Side culture, that is sometimes kind of hard to do. Right? But if the paralyzed man had said, oh, I'm good, I got this, don't pick up my mat, I'm good, I'm good, I got this, he never would have been healed. So the question is, am I transparent enough for others to see that I've got a mat? The messy stuff, the problems, the sins, the fears, the failures, the stuff we struggle with. Or am I pretending to have it all together the way that the pathology of our East Side culture tells us to do? Some of you have, have heard me talk uh, about a time when my kids were growing up, and they all, they all swam. And every summer at one of the swim meets in our summer pool, the parents competed. And, and, and the, the heats were divided by age, and my category was 18 and over. Okay, is that fair? Like 18 versus middle-aged me, right? The first race, the guy in the lane next to me was 19 years old, and he was on his college swim team, right? And there I am, middle-aged me, and he looked at me and he said, don't hurt yourself. <laughs> and then he said, I'll be waiting for you at the end of the pool, right? And I was like, oh, be quiet, Michael Phelps, right? <laughs> sure enough, by the time I got to the end, he was out of the water, dried, dressed, and reading a book, right? <laughs> Not quite, but felt like that. And I remember feeling embarrassed next to Mr. College Swim Team guy. Why? Why? Because we feel this pressure to be perfect, to have it all together, right? No flaws. But in Christian community, we admit we've got mats and we need help. Sometimes that's very tangible and practical things like bring a meal or help with transportation or companionship. But it also means we're honest about our sins, our failures, our flaws, not to everyone, but to a few trusted Christian friends so that they can make Jesus' forgiveness more real because when someone says you're forgiven, when you hear it from someone else, it makes it more real. And so that they can encourage us and empower us to repent from those sins and become the people that God calls us to be and that we want to be. 
That's why the first thing Jesus says to this paralyzed man is, son, your sins are forgiven, right? And the man's probably like, yeah, that's nice, but my legs, what about my legs, right? But, but Jesus, see, he wants to heal this man's deepest need before he gets to his paralysis. And his deepest need is his shame. Because we all have sins. We all have stuff we're ashamed of. This man maybe even thought the reason he was paralyzed is God was punishing him for his sins. So his friends carry him to Jesus who relieves his, his shame and by saying your sins are forgiven. God is not mad at you. You are not being punished. And then Jesus makes him a new man who can walk again. We admit our flaws and we point each other to Jesus who relieves our shame and makes us new and gives us power to repent and become the people that we want to be. There are people in this room who can handle your mat. And sometimes our mat is simply that we're paralyzed in our faith. We're stuck and we need others to help us grow. And just in case, by the way, just in case you're sitting there thinking, oh great, now I have to carry everyone's mats. Like that's a lot of mats, right? There's a lot of mats in this church. No, no, just a few people that God leads you to. And no, this is not miserable experience. It brings joy because Every study shows what makes us happy is people, relationships. And I'll give you an example in a bit. Second, in biblical community, we do hard things. So this man's friends would have had to carry him through the streets, digging a hole in the roof. That's not easy, right? They had to work hard. Community isn't always easy. Jesus said, where two or more of you are gathered, there I will also be. He just as easily could have said, where two or more of you are gathered, there's conflict going to be. Jesus' disciples were radically different than each other. One was a tax collector who collaborated with the occupying Roman army to exploit his fellow Jews. The other was a zealot committed to the overthrow of the Roman Empire. And they're in the same small group, right? But when Jesus called his disciples to follow him, he simultaneously called them to a community of people different than they were. The two calls come together. It is not an option. Community is mandatory for becoming like Jesus. We have to do it. There are people in this church who, who are different than you. They, they like different things in worship than you do. They vote differently than you do. Some folks here are Presbyterian down to their core. Other folks are Pentecostal, Charismatics. That's why we always say we're Presbycostal or Presbymatics or whatever you want to call us. Right? We are doing something here very rare, a multi-generational, multicultural, multiracial community. That's just not happening in a lot of places. And we have had people leave this church. We've had people leave this church and say to us, point blank, I just want to be in a church of people like me. At least they were honest. But it breaks my heart for two reasons. First, it's not biblical. Okay, like here's a verse you're not going to find in the Bible. You can look, but it's not there. Oh man, you guys are just so different. So let's have a church for Jewish people and a church for Gentile people, a church for older people and one for younger people, a church for liberals and a church for conservatives. That verse ain't there. It's, not, it's just not biblical. And then second, we miss out if everyone is just like us. So I was here Friday night for prayer and fasting, and there, there are a lot of East African folks from New Hope Revival in the lobby praying very loudly, praying very loudly in Kinyarwandan. There were Chinese people praying in Mandarin. There were people in the welcome room praying silently, and I thought, oh my goodness, the kingdom of God. Just a few minutes ago, when we sang that chorus in our different languages, do you feel that? Do you feel the power of that? The kingdom of God, as it's supposed to be, every tribe, tongue, and nation. And so on prayer and fasting night when I was here, I, I came into this room, it was dark, there was no one else here, I knelt in front of that cross, and I just spent some time thanking God that I get to be part of this church. And I prayed for all of you. And then I went over into the sanctuary and I did the same thing. So grateful to be part of a church that is becoming more and more the whole family of God. To be in a church where everyone is just like us, man, that, to me, that's spiritual poverty. And yeah, community can be hard. Hard is the point. It's not a bug. It's a feature of community because it's by working through the hard and the conflict, and the differences, and learning to forgive each other, that's how we become more like Jesus, more loving, more patient, more kind. Because see, community reminds us that the universe, with only one tiny exception, is composed entirely of other people. And we need people, even people we find difficult, to help us grow in our faith. And the great thing about church is, there are difficult people everywhere. Just look around this room. 
There are difficult, there are difficult people over here. There are difficult people over, and here in the middle, doesn't even talk about, like, just like, they're just like, this room is filled with diff, difficult, I'm a difficult person. We all need that to grow. And as we've said before, if you don't have a difficult person in your life, talk to one of the pastors and we'll assign you somebody. <laughs> Maybe one of the pastors. Because it helps us grow and experience Jesus. The bigness expands our experience of Jesus. We carry each other's mats. We do hard things. And finally, we are amazed together. When Jesus heals the paralyzed man, the text says this blew everyone's minds. And they praise God. All of Jesus' miracles happen in community. All of his miracles, there's people around for his miracles because God's power is released in community. There is power when we come together in the same room, worshiping together. That's not available to us by ourselves online. And even if you come here and you don't talk to anyone, we would hope that you would, but even if you don't, right, like just to be in a room with other Christians and to know you're not alone in our faith, that makes such a difference. It's so much better in person. And online is great for when you can't be here. And so please keep attending online when you can't be here. <clears throat> and some of you you're, you, you're online, but you're with other people, like at Timber Ridge and, 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 and Emerald Heights and Pacific Regions. That's also great because there's power in community. As a church, we have been able to do things together that we never could have done on our own. Center for Champions has gotten 1,000 kids off the streets in Rwanda and given them job skills and introduced them to Jesus. The Jubilee Reach that here in the east side, breaking cycles of poverty. We are currently helping to resettle refugees from all over the world to show them Jesus' love. God moves more powerfully when we are in community together. And I know that having prayed and fasted together as a community this weekend, there's going to be stories of how God worked. And please tell me those stories so that I can tell those stories, we can tell those stories to the rest of the church to encourage them because we're just better together. So action step. Get connected. Join an all-in group or a service team here on Sunday morning. Help resettle refugees. There's an information meeting today at 1230. Or maybe your next move in community is to get a little more honest about your flaws and your sins so others can carry you to Jesus. And for all of us, we can practice community today like in like five or 10 minutes um, by going upstairs up to the upper campus uh, after the service where there's food and eat together and hang out together and there's tables inside. If the weather's a little cold, you can go inside. There's tables in there. Maybe introduce yourself to some other people right after this service. Did I mention there's food? There's food. Go up there. I got an email from a woman in our church who I'll call Stephanie because that's her name. And she said I could use it. And she said the, the sermon series we did earlier on Sabbath was really transforming for her. She said she's a super busy person, lots of things to do. But when Pastor Sergio said in a sermon that efficiency is the enemy of community and that we need to, quote, waste time and eat together more, she said that really struck her. She said efficiency is my middle name and I do not like wasting time. But... She started to observe Sabbath a little more in her life and focus a little more on relationships. So instead of leaving right after church, she and her husband stick around and talk to people, introduce themselves to people they don't know. Well, in January, uh, Stephanie met a mom and her two kids who had just moved here uh, a month earlier. And I'm going to pick it up in her words. This is what Stephanie wrote to me. She said, we exchanged phone numbers because this mom had a question and I promised to find the answer and get back to her, which I did. Well, a few days later, I was thinking about how much I enjoyed talking with her, and the thought came to me to ask her to coffee. Okay, asking someone I just met and don't know to coffee is way out of my comfort zone, and not just because I don't like coffee. I'm an introvert, and chatting with people I don't know is not one of my spiritual gifts. And I could see that this would be a way to help people new to our church feel at home and support families with kids, but I just wasn't sure I wanted to follow through because it's, as an introvert, it's outside my comfort zone. But I felt God strongly wanted me to do this. Well, the next Sunday, I got sick, so I worshiped online at home. That afternoon, my new friend texted me and said she'd looked for me at church but hadn't seen me. Here was my opportunity. I texted back that I was sick, but would she like to go to coffee sometime soon? She immediately texted back that she would. So we started meeting about once a week. 
My new friend, isn't that a nice phrase? New friend is from Rwanda. And I quickly learned that meeting for coffee equates to a two-hour conversation in her culture. <laughs> Before this year's sermons, I might have gotten stressed about taking so long, talking with someone when I have so many things to do, but now that I know we're supposed to waste time and eat together, I'm able to relax and enjoy the conversation. As a child, my new friend suffered greatly during the genocide against Tutsis in Rwanda. But since our church has been so involved in Rwanda for so long, I knew something about their culture and I could ask intelligent questions about her life in Rwanda. My friend has a 13-year-old daughter, an infant, and was pregnant with baby number three. As we continued to meet, our friendship grew. We talked about our dreams, potential jobs, potential baby names. And then a few weeks ago, my friend called me and asked if I would come to the hospital and support her as the baby was coming that day. What an honor and joy to be with her, holding her hand during the birth of her baby girl. I never expected I'd get to experience a birth from that side of things, having only been present by necessity at the birth of my own kids. <laughs> but I got to experience the joy of a new birth with my new friend. Since then, we continue to meet together for walks and conversation. If you had told me a year ago that I would meet someone brand new from a different culture and ask them to coffee and hang out regularly, I would not have believed you because it was so far from my normal way of living. I have found, though, that by following God's nudge, I have thoroughly enjoyed, see, community brings joy, enjoyed this new friendship. If I had not slowed down to practice Sabbath and been willing to step out of my comfort zone to ask someone I didn't know to coffee, think of all I would have missed. I love that last line. Think of all I would have missed. Life in community is just bigger. It's just better. It's just more joy. I am here because in spite of my flaws and my sins and my failures, people in my life carried me to Jesus when I needed that and have lovingly held me accountable and encouraged me to become the man that Jesus is calling me to be. We are better together. When Jesus moves through us together, lost people get found and found people grow. Lonely people find family, hurting people find healing, bored people find purpose, broken people find wholeness, churches ignite, cities find hope, nations heal, and the kingdom of God comes from heaven to earth when Jesus moves through us together. So Jesus, thank you so much for what you're doing in this church. Thank you for New Hope. Thank you for Chinese Covenant. Thank you that not everyone here votes the same way I do or likes the same things in worship that I do. Thank you that there are people here from a different culture who speak a different language and are different generations. Lord, you unite what the world divides, and we are in a divided world right now. So Jesus, do in us what only you can do. Make us one. Out of all these differences, weave us together and make us one and show our hurting and broken and divided world what you can do so the whole world knows that you are Lord. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.